Uh, good morning. Thank you all. Um, viticulture, that is the growing of grapes and winemaking, are among the oldest professions on the planet, dating back to ancient Egypt and China and even beyond. The old world of vinifera grape, which produces the classic French and Italian wines, originated in the Republic of Georgia, which used to be in southern Russia, and spread through the Mediterranean, then inland across Asia and Europe. But it never made the journey across the ocean to North America, at least not on its own. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Grapes of the New World evolved separately and are a completely different kind of animal, so to speak, with roots which have a much thicker um, outer skin. And that's because this country is full of pests and diseases trying to feed on and otherwise annihilate them. There is one particular bug which plays an important part in my story, and that's a very tiny louse named Phylloxera, which likes to set up shop in grape roots. It's native to the United States, so it wasn't originally present in Europe or the Mediterranean. American grapes adapted to the phylloxera problem by developing the proverbial thick skin, which the pests could not chew through. And don't forget that because it's important to the story. Grape cultivation began in this country in 1562 when a French colony near St. Augustine, Florida, planted a vineyard using native scuppernog grapes. About 1616, settlers in my home state of Virginia were required by law to plant grapevines to produce a cash crop for the English colony at Jamestown. They didn't like the taste of the local native grapes, so they decided to go all out, and they imported both vinifera grapes and the grape growers from France. 10,000 vines were planted, and they all died. Why? Because they had no immunity to our New World soil and diseases such as phylloxera, and they didn't like the dirt. It wasn't what they were used to. So remember that because it's another important part of the story. So how did winemaking begin here in Texas? We were first, as you know, a province of Spain along with the rest of Mexico. And the place was teeming with wild grapes. Early travelers reported seeing vines that covered the trees so thoroughly that whole groves were bound together by the grapevines. Almost half of the 36 varieties of grapes grown in Texas today are natives, and that's more than can be found anywhere else in the world. That's also why there are so many locations in Texas named for, for grapes. One of the first actions the Spanish government took to start civilizing this part of the world was to send in Catholic priests to establish missions in what are now Socorro, New Mexico, and in El Paso. And if you've been to Taos, you know this is not either Socorro or El Paso, this is Taos, but I like this church. In the 1620s, using irrigation systems and Native American labor, the priests planted a European vines sent over from France, not native grapes, a European, to produce sacramental wines for use in church rituals. And amazingly, the vinifera vines were just as happy as little clams because the warm climate, the low humidity, and the soil there was very similar to the area of France where they originated. Then in the 1840s, Texas received a surge of immigration from Europe and particularly from Germany. They also brought old world grape vines with them to coastal Texas and the hill country, but most of them died since the environments, the terroir as the French call it, in those regions were not those of El Paso. Instead, settlers turned to native varieties such as Mustang grapes and added a lot of sugar to help both the fermentation process and the taste. But still, people kept trying to grow old world grapes and the vines kept dying. Everybody agreed that there should be a good industry here, just look at how all the native grapes flourished. But it didn't happen despite many efforts. Then along came a man who approached the problem from a completely different angle, a man who believed that you could make a European and American vines work together. His name was Thomas Volney Munson. Born on an Illinois farm in 1843, Volney's passion for horticulture was first aroused by his mother, Maria, 
who was interested in scientific gardening and by her father, an English landscaper. In 1866, when the Kentucky Agricultural and Mechanical College, which is now the University of Kentucky, when it opened, Volney and his older brother Ben enrolled and would become its first two graduates. Volney studied science with an eye to operating his own nursery. The second half of the 19th century witnessed just the most amazing transformation in how humans viewed their world thanks to science. Concepts and interrelationships that we take for granted were new and marvelous discoveries in, in Munson's day. Volney started college only six years after Darwin wrote his Origin of Species and barely a year after Mendel first described his theories of plant heredity. Science was fast becoming the new god which would make life easier and better. His studies at Kentucky A&M started Volney on his grape odyssey when he began to realize the endless combinations that could be made of various grape varieties to create new and better hybrids. Horticulture, if you're not familiar with the word, is simply the science of cultivating plants and flowers for gardens, orchards, nursery, whatever. And if you practice horticulture, you're a horticulturist. And I tell you from the bottom of my heart that the hardest part of writing this book was learning to spell and pronounce horticulturist. <coughs> Volney arrived in North Texas in 1876 and settled in the brand new town of Denison on the Red River in Grayson County near his siblings who had moved there several years earlier. Volney had visited Denison after several disastrous years in Nebraska and was overwhelmed by the number of wild native grape varieties growing there and especially in the sandy soils along the Red River. He dubbed it his grape paradise and he would build a commercial nursery to service, serve as both his business and research facility. It sold all types of products as you can see from this ad. And I'll just point out here that grapes were not Volney's only interest. Over the years, over the decades rather, he originated, that is he created and hybridized many new plants such as a strawberry, several crepe myrtles, mulberries, apples, peaches, and pears. In Denison, Volney divided his work into two parts. First, he would locate, describe, and classify examples of all American grapes, not just Texas, all the country, and to correct earlier classifications of them. Secondly, he would develop new and better varieties through scientific crossbreeding of both native grapes and commercial cultivars such as vinif vinifers and, excuse me, vinifera, can't read my own writing, and other old world grapes. Now, just stop and think about the magnitude of that, tech, that task in 1876. Just the travel and the time involved in finding all those different grapes. There's no interstate highway or automobiles, no handy American airlines to jet off across the country. Even railroads were just beginning to spread through Texas then. Yet Volney succeeded in both of his goals, traveling at least 75,000 miles by train, on foot, and on horseback to visit most of the continental United States and small portions of Canada and Mexico. His initial research then on identifying, classifying, and cataloging American grapes was not conducted solely in his lab in Denison, but in isolated canyons or the deep recesses of forests, along riverbanks, in valleys, and on mountaintops, none of them easy to reach then bringing home cuttings and seeds to study and to crossbreed with the goal of developing new grapes resistant to drought, insects, and disease. He kept meticulous records and preserved the leaves, stems, and fruit he found by pressing and drying them on, uh, mounting them on uh, paper. Many of his herbarium specimens, as they're called, can be found today in the Smithsonian at the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis, in the National Agricultural School at Montpellier, France, and at Fort Worth's own Botanical Research Institute, among other places. And I know this because Roy Renfro and I, my, my co-writer, and I went to every one of these places and more, trying to track his travel. It was the only way we could, we could do it. And what dry, dusty, spore-laden, antique herbarium specimens can do to your allergies is not to be believed. 
When his new grape classification was finally finished, Volney planned to publish it through the United States Department of Agriculture. The cover of the first edition of our book, pictured here, featured one of the paintings commissioned by the USDA for it. But Congress dragged its feet. Some things apparently do not change. They never appropriated the money, and so the book was never completed, much to Volney's rage. Foundations, uh, excuse me, eventually in 1909, he self-published his work as Foundations of American Grape Culture, and it's still available online, by the way. In it, he described 27 species native to America, including one that had been named in his honor, and it remains still the basic classification used today. Foundations is still in print after 112 years, still used by vineyardists, and still required reading in viticultural classes around the world. Volney also built an ever-expanding circle of contacts with other viticulturists and horticulturists around the world, and soon became known for the, both the quality of his research and his dedication to being a professional and a scientist. Even as he undertook the monumental task of botanically reclassifying American grapes, he began giving papers which would reinforce that reputation. And I love this particular drawing of his. He called this his flying safety machine, but you can look at it and tell it's pretty much a helicopter. He had an uncanny ability to see the future, accurately forecasting the coming global population explosion as well as major famines in third world countries which would surely, in his opinion, result from simply ma maintaining the old standard ways in horticulture. Now, why do I tell you this? Because that exposure brought Volney Munson into the horticultural spotlight and to the attention of grape-growing countries in Europe, which were then battling what I like to call the bug that ate France. Now, you remember the little root-sucking phylloxera I showed you earlier? Well, the old world grapes may have never made it across the ocean to America by natural means, but our American phylloxera did cross the ocean to Europe when horticulturists there, particularly in France, began importing American grapevines in the 1850s and 60s for experimental purposes. Apparently, no one gave a thought to any critters or diseases that might come along with the vines, and a few decades earlier, it wouldn't have mattered because the overseas trip was so long, any uninvited passengers would have died on the voyage over. But by the mid-19th century, faster clipper and steamships began changing all that. So Phylloxera arrived in France, the world's premier wine-producing country, and wreaked absolute havoc. The more delicate and thin-skinned vines there basically offered up a smorgasbord for our little American bug. The resulting devastation was not confined to just one country, but was worldwide. There are almost no countries in the world, even today, you can find that don't still have phylloxera. It began its attack in France in the mid-1860s and moved at more than 12 miles per year across the countryside. They spread across all of Europe, Russia, parts of the Middle East, even Australia, and back here to Mexico, California, and most of South America costing untold billions of dollars in lost revenues. Vineyards were stripped and dead in a matter of days. The ancient wine houses supported by them left ruined. Everyone had an idea about whom or what to blame, as you might expect. And there were just as many proposed solutions, and some of them were pretty off the wall. Poisoning the aphids with toad venom, electrifying them, and drowning them in human urine are among my personal among my personal favorites, sorry about that. Eventually, the conversation always took back to a, turned back to a solution under discussion for years, and that was grafting the European vinifera vines onto resistant American rootstocks. Grafting is where you take a cutting from a variety you want and you literally bind it to another rootstock. A grape variety can grow on any grape rootstock. It's the upper part of the vine, not the root, which determines what kind of grape you get. But French vineyardists were quite reluctant to adopt this particular grafting, as you might imagine, seeing as how phylloxera called America home to begin with. But finally giving in to the inevitable, the French sent an expert to select locations in this country, then shipped over thousands of tons of vines, primarily from Missouri and South Texas. They grafted their little hearts out and they waited for a miracle, but nothing happened. The vines continued to die. 
It should have worked and nobody could understand why it didn't. It turned out that in the panic and hysteria produced by the speed of the infestation, no one had stopped to consider a very simple element, one on which they were literally standing, the dirt. There is an old maxim in viticulture that says the poorer the land, the better the quality of grape and consequently the wine. French vineyards, particularly those in the most devastated regions of southern France, were often planted in thin, chalky, limey soils, unlike those in most of the United States and from which the vines had been shipped. By 1880, two million acres of French vines, just French, had been destroyed and a complete failure of the industry was expected within two decades if no solution was found. In 1887, merchants and viticulturists in the Cognac district of western France decided to take one more chance on America. And this time they sent a young professor of viticulture from the National Agricultural School in Montpellier. Pierre Viella was charged with finding, searching for vines that grew in America's poorest soils. He began his research on the eastern seaboard, and this map is a little bit hard to read because it's kind of old, but he found nothing suitable there, so he moved on to Tennessee and Missouri. There's a, a black line, oops, if you can see it, it starts back up on the east coast and it winds around to California and then back to the coast. But Texas's abundant lower Cretaceous formations, composed of limestone laid down by prehistoric seas, beckoned him southward. Now we finally arrive back at, at our Mr. Munson. Pierre Viola went straight to Denison and spent several weeks there with Volney. The two men had been corresponding for years about how to fight phylloxera, and Viola had studied Munson's radical new classification of American grapes. After days spent taking notes in Volney's testing grounds, library, and archives, and more time collecting specimens to take back to France, Pierre Viola was ready to proceed. And Volney knew just where to send him, to the Temple Belton area of Bell County on the edge of the Edwards Plateau, where Berlandieri grapes grow in profusion on ancient marine-based limestone soils. Though Volney had never been to Europe, and as far as we know, he never did go, he knew that those limestone hills in Texas matched those of many grape growing areas of France where the rivers can literally run white from runoff. Pierre Viella also found two other species in the area, the Cineria or sweet winter grape and Cordifolia the frost grape, which grew in other states too. Now, he didn't want any of those. He wanted only stock that came that grew in te central Texas soils. His lengthy report to the French Ministry of Agriculture on his trip of nearly 10,000 miles would recommend that only those three species, in Berlandiera in particular, and of them only cuttings from Texas could save French vineyards. He also lavished much praise on Volney Munson, whom he described as a modest Texas scientist. Viola recommended that Munson and two others who aided him on his trip receive one of France's highest honors, and pardon my French, the Chevalier du Merite Agricole in the Legion of Honor, which was presented to Volney in Denison early in 1889. Soon a brisk business in shipping hundreds of thousands of cuttings from Texas to France began. Volney himself spent time in the Belton area overseeing the process and shipped more from his own vineyards. This photo shows Munson, he's standing on the right with the flashy little derby, and his nursery crew box, boxing cuttings to go overseas. We're uncertain how many of his rootstocks survive and are still in use there, but we do know that Chateau Pavie in Bordeaux was still producing Merlot from Munson nursery rootstocks a few years ago. This was a very big business. The winemaking district of Cognac alone spent the modern equivalent of nearly a billion and a half dollars to rebuild their vineyards. For that reason, and because Pierre Viola did much of his subsequent research and testing in Cognac, a close relationship has developed between the French city and Denison, Texas. They have been sister cities since 1992, and in 2006, Dr. Roy, Arth uh, Dr. Roy Renfro, my co-author, and I were honored to debut the first edition of Great Man of Texas 
and cognac at their lovely museum devoted to the making of that brandy. We visited cognac houses, as they're called there, and even the region's then new facilities where they have also begun making regular wines. And ask any grape grower or winemaker in cognac who Thomas Volney Munson was, and you'll probably get a very passionate response. In fact, wineries in a number of French wine districts mentioned him on their guided tours. Until our research, he was probably better known in France than he was here. Texas historian Archie McDonald has called Volney the transplanted Texan whose transplanting saved France. So how did this uh, Texas story turn out? In terms of actual production or as grafting stop, the Texas Berlandieri grape proved to be difficult to root when it was transplanted from the wild. It's a difference. But as the basis of crossbreeding, it was a smashing success and became the parent of some 500 grape cultivars still bred around the world for drought tolerance and resistance to phylloxera. And the reason they're still bred is because phylloxera is, remains a global problem still. Volney had his own smash successes in breeding. By the time he died in 1913, he had originated more than 300 new grape varieties, more than any other American then or since, and plant, placing him among the top seven breeders in the world. He did this at his denizen nursery, which became the largest such business in the southern United States. He exhibited and won gold medals at the 1889 Exposition Universelle in Paris, held in the shadow of the new Eiffel Tower, at the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago, and the Louisiana Purchase Exposition of 1904 in St. Louis. His display of American grapes at the Chicago Expo was the largest and most comprehensive ever mounted and remains so to this day. Volney do donated it to the Smithsonian Institution, where it is still in the collection but has been broken down into components. He received many honors and helped establish or belonged to some of the world's most famous scientific organizations, including what is now the American Genetics Association. Thomas Volney Munson died in 1913 at the age of only 69. His son Will ran the commercial side of the nursery until his own death, but the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station, now part of Cornell, took over much of Volney's research. The business and its plant stocks were eventually sold out of the family in the 1930s. Many of Munson's hybrid grapes were also lost when thousands of acres of American vineyards were cut down or plowed under during Prohibition. Even Vanita, his residence and the showplace for his nursery products, passed out of the family in 1960. Much of the property was then plowed under for streets and housing developments. The real tragedy is this. Almost all of Volney's personal and professional papers were destroyed several decades after his death. And we know that they once filled the huge attic of, a, of a Vanita. Lost were his field notes, his manuscripts, the diaries from his many grape hunting trips across the country, and his voluminous correspondence with horticulture's most prominent figures, such as Luther Burbank. The same family member who sent his papers to the dump also sold much of his equipment. And his important award, the Legion of Honor, which is in the middle here, was sold to a junk man during the Depression of the 1930s. So what happened to the Texas wine and grape industry amidst all the publicity which Munson brought to the state in his lifetime? By 1900, there were nearly 30 wineries here. We actually exported wine to California that year, if you can believe that. But prohibition brought all this progress to a screeching halt in 1919. During the first half of the 20th century, agriculture as a whole began to fade as Texas's main industry replaced by oil and gas, railroads, and cattle. But that situation changed once more in the late 60s and 70s when wine replaced cocktails in popularity. The first new Texas vineyards were planted in Springtown, which is in Parker County, near here, and in Lubbock. By 1976, there were enough statewide to organize the Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association, and from there, the industry has grown by unbelievable bounds every year. Today, Texas has more than 400 wineries and over 4,300 acres of vineyards. The industry had a total economic 
impact of more than $13 billion on our state economy in 2018, which was the most recent report I could find. Texas in and is and has been for several years the fifth largest wine producing state in the country and is the seventh largest producer of wine grapes. The industry provides over 104,000 jobs and draws 1.7 million visitors who spend over $700 million in the state in 2018. Wine, by the way, is now made in every state in the Union and we are the fourth largest producing country in the world behind Italy, France, and Spain. Some, they shuffle around a little bit from year to year, but roughly that. And virtually all grapevines grown today for wine production are either hybrids descended from native American native grapes or viniferous grafted onto native rootstock because of the continuing problems of phylloxera. All this activity, which began in the 1970s, regenerated interest in the grape man of Texas, Thomas Volney Munson. In 1974, people started tracking down his grapes and material about his life and worked to establish a memorial vineyard on the west campus of Grayson College near Denison. In the spring of 1975, my friend Roy planted the first cutting in it. He has spent many years searching for Munson hybrids, but has thus far been able to find less than a third of them. Behind the vineyard is the TV Munson Viticulture and Enology Center, which houses a collection and research archives on Volney, as well as the classrooms and labs used in Grayson College's many viticulture courses leading to a degree. It's one of the first of its kind in a Texas community college and one of the few degreed programs in the country. Grayson College also acquired Vanita in 2004 and opened it in 2009 after a long and extensive restoration. Roy has even been able to acquire some of the original Munson furniture. The house and the vineyard are open for tours by appointment. My part in this whole story came in 1997 when the W.B. Munson family in Denison, that's Volney's brother, asked me to write Volney's biography. I ended up collaborating with Roy, who will, was and forever will be Mr. T.V. Munson, and the research consumed way more years than I expected and required many trips throughout the country and several to France. Such are the hardships of an historian and a writer. Sorry, I keep doing that. <clears throat> Great Man of Texas was first published in the spring of 2004. The beautiful color cover illustrated with one of the watercolors done for Volney's intended USDA book. Soon after its release, we were contacted by Edouard Cointreau of the French wine and liqueur making family, who is the president and founder of the Gourmand World Cookbook Awards. Headquartered in Madrid, the Gourmands are the Oscars of international food and wine books. Fortunately for us, Edouard is from Cognac, Denison's sister city, and as soon as he saw our book, he knew its value. We must enter the competition, he wrote us, so of course, not being stupid, we did enter. In 2004, more than 4,500 books from around the world duped it out in Gourmand's 35 food and 15 wine categories. Just after Thanksgiving that year, we were named Best Wine History Book in English United States. It's such a huge competition, they break it down by language. Gourmand also instituted a rating system that year, and Great Man was one of the first 19 books internationally to win the top three-star designation. Then it was on to Sweden in February 2005 for the final competition. And when we got there and I saw the other books we were up against, my heart failed me. But that long cognac connection came to the rescue. Mr. Quantro telling the audience that without TV Munson, wine might be only past history. We were named best wine history book in the world for 2004, beating out competitors from England, Spain, France, Holland, and Germany. 2008, Gourmand contacted us again. They had decided to select the 100 best food and wine books from their first 12 years. The awards to be given in Germany as part of the Frankfurt Book Fair, the largest in the world. Great Man was, on, was one of only three wine books so honored, the others being a massive tome on Mouton Rothschild's Museum of Wine and Art and a biography of wine expert Robert Parker. To our surprise, with all, all the book winners, wine book winners carried home bottles of 1955 Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. These were from Mr. Cointreau's private cellar and were ceremoniously uncrated on stage by a master sommelier. 
Our book is now in its second and revised edition, published in 2008 by the Wine Appreciation Guild of San Francisco. A paperback has replaced the original hardback and there is even an electronic edition. And this second edition includes a full list of all of Munson's, uh, the, the varieties that he created. There had been plans for a French translation to be published by Ferre, the oldest wine publisher in France. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you exactly what's going on with that. The 2008 recession really hit publishers hard around the world. And because of Roy's retirement not long after, we have not really been able to maintain a push towards that project. Mr. Munson, the grape man of Texas and the world, has taken me many places I never thought to go and has given me the chance to drink a lot of good wine. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And, I, and just for your information, I'm leaving Monday to go to Dripping Springs. I'm speaking, speaking to the Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association there, and I'm giving them roughly the same program. <laughs>